Welcome everybody to the first day of the semifinals in the uh, Gold Money Asian Rapid. Today we have Magnus Carlsen uh, taking on Armenian Lion, Levon Ranyan. They've played each other a few times in these playoffs, but Levon had an absolutely dominant preliminary stage. He like got 10 and a half or 11 points, something absolutely massive out of 15. So Magnus got to tame the Lion. And we also have two uh, newcomers to the playoffs, uh, Dingli Ren and Vladislav Artemyev. Artemyev like, hasn't played much of these events at all, so very interesting to see how this all shakes out. Uh, I'm going to take you through the critical games. We're going to go match by match, timestamps on the video player, uh, and I hope you're all having a great day. So, uh, game number one between Dingli Ren and Artemyev was a draw. It was a long game. It was like 70-something moves. Uh, I'm marking it here on the standings, and this is game number two. Dingli Ren begins with d4. We have two Grandmasters playing, so of course we have a Queen's Gambit declined. Knight f3 and a6. So Magnus Carlsen has been playing this a6 move, uh, and I guess Artemyev is inspired by that, so if Magnus can do it, I can do it too. And the point is that you want to take on c4 and then go b5. That's, that's it. And what White does here is to take on d5 and essentially tell you like you've wasted a, a move going a6. This is a stupid move, it doesn't belong in the position. And what Black says, it's actually not a stupid move at all, uh, because the Queen's Gambit is so solid that me wasting a turn just playing a solid pawn move, you know, not all pawns are created the same way. h5, for example, in this position, or g5, for that matter, hanging a pawn, would not be the same as playing the move a6. So black goes for this structure, the scaly pawn structures of the light squares, d, uh, bishop d6, bishop g5, and Artemiev here could do something chill like short castle or attack the bishop or... Uh, even f6 is not the world's stupidest move and try to bring the knight to try to get this away. But he plays this. Um, and that allows an interesting sequence of sacrificing the queen to then win this queen back. And we have a situation where we're going to have a queenless and one bishopless middle game. So bishop d3, the knight has to go back because defending it would lead to a... This is a catastrophically terrible pawn structure. So we have knight to e7... And now Dingli Ren here doesn't just lazily play short castle. He doesn't lazily play the super GM move, which is pawn to h4 for absolutely no reason, although uh, that's coming later. Um, he actually plays a very interesting move. Uh, and this move is only justified because he has a lead in development and the tactics and dynamic factors of the position work in White's favor. He opens up the center of the board despite not being castled because there's no queens. So his king is not actually in any danger. Now, if this were to happen, I would immediately take back targeting the bishop. I would go knight g5. Yes, you can give me a check, but I actually can... Con I can't. Sorry, I meant to highlight that square. You can't cast a lot of check. Um, so king f1, and you would use then the bishop's positioning against, uh, against him. So instead of that, Artemiev actually plays f6, awaiting something in the center, and that's where Ding just castles. Now Ding is like, well, now I'm castled, and I'm opening up the center of the board. Knight d7, rookie 1, takes, takes. And yes, you can play bishop before attacking my rook, sure, but I'm going to move my rook out of the way. And now I see that your knight wants to come here, so I just play g3. Rook e8, let me kick your bishop out, your bishop goes away, and I finish my development. All right, so first move with the full completion of development. What do you do? Remember I told you what do super GMs do when they don't know what to do? It's actually the best move in the position. h4. It's really funny. Uh, yeah, it's like really funny. Like I'm, I'm like dying over here laughing. Excuse me, all of white's pawns are on dark squares. The enemy bishop is a dark squared bishop. This is a light squared bishop. So you corral the enemy pieces with the dark squared structure. But also, this is a hook. This is a, a, a pawn uh, in, 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 a, in a structure that can be targeted. These flank pawn advances with h4, h5 are super useful uh, to damage structure, to make doubled isolated pawns. And uh, Ding actually invites some tactics here. So if knight c3, rook e8... Uh, and if rook takes rook, I throw in this capture with check, and then this, and then king d5. I mean, Artemyev does some fancy transfer of the king. He also could have taken with the pawn. Um, but too fancy for his own good, because this transformation, although it's given me an active king, uh, no check is useful here. Now we continue with our plan of h5. And, and Artemyev has a very difficult problem to solve. He is constantly a move behind in this game. Like, Ding, Ding is just ahead of him by a move. I mean, if you gave Artemyev, like, g5, h6, and rook, e, rook, I don't even know, d, that's three moves, but, I mean, even g5 here is not good, because you're gonna, you're gonna take, but let's say you're just not allowed to take, and we get this, this is still a very bad position for black. Why? Light squared weaknesses, bad king in the center, rook controls the only open file, 
lot of problems for, for, for black. I mean, just simply too many weaknesses. Uh, he goes f5, but that allows, um, that allows something else that's really nasty. Uh, here, Dingley Ren finds an absolutely killer move. And it's, it's not even clear why it's so killer when you first look at it. Uh, try to find it. You're more than welcome. You probably won't. Some of you might, but you probably won't. It's, I mean, you know, naturally you're thinking takes, knight g5, knight h4. I, I, don't, I probably wouldn't even find this move. Um, bishop to b1. Utilizing the dumb king position with bishop a2 and just sneaking in from the back and, listen, uh, hitting those pawns from, from the other side is, uh, is going to be a, a problem. Uh, although it'll feel pretty good for Dingley Ren because he's going to win definitely one of them. So c5, Artemiev tries to do something, but it, it just doesn't work. He cannot possibly protect against all the threats. And uh, now Artemiev is forced to sacrifice a pawn. And he actually sacrifices two of them. And his logic as well, his pawns are doubled. So this is good for me. Um, the thing is, it's not good for him at all. And uh, he just gets all his pieces paralyzed. And I mean, again, this whole game, it felt like he was just a move slow. And Ding Li Ren now just pushes his pawn all the way down the board. Uh, finally takes to get rid of that. Now the king has wandered off. And even though black can finally win back the two pawns, you're making a queen. Or if you'd like to bad manner your opponent, you're more than welcome to make a rook. Although you should be careful with bad manners because if you make a knight, I'm not so sure you're actually going to win this game. Uh, bishop c5, king g2, a4, you know, f7, but I'm going to sack the bishop. So be careful with your bad manners, all right? So anyway, e7 played and uh, black resigns. Very, very convincing victory from start to finish by Ding Loren. I mean, you cannot outclass a super grandmaster more convincingly than that. That... That was just outstanding play from Dingli Ren, and he really is looking like the Dingli Ren who was ranked top five in the world in all ratings just a few years ago. Top three in classical, I believe actually maybe he was top three in all ratings, rapid and blitz. Like, think about that. The guy's the top three in the world in rapid, blitz, and classical. You know who else has that distinction? Magnus Carlsen. They were the only two people on earth, because Fabiano Caruana is not so great at rapid, so, and blitz. Uh, anyway, game number three, now Artemiev has to fight back, so what does he do? Artemiev plays a King's Indian attack. He played this against the niche. He likes this. He likes this knight of three, g3, d3. He likes to, you know, um, play like this with e4. Okay, this is the second time uh, in this recap that I've gotten so excited with my speaking that I spit. And I don't know if y'all can see it, but if you can, I'm very sorry about that. I'm not going to edit it out. I'm just going to tell you I'm a human being, you know? I might be a large YouTube creator, but I do stupid things as well. And sometimes that means project spit onto my screen. So... Hopefully we can limit that for the duration of the... the, the I, had to, I had to verbally complain about it, though. I'd like to apologize to you formally. Queen e2, knight c6, a4. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm used to c3. Um, Ding Li Ren hasn't done anything super impressive yet. He's just put pieces on squares, uh, which I suppose is literally the entire uh, virtue of chess. But uh, virtue? What? That's not even the right word. What are you even... Anyway. You'll notice what he does here, though. He takes on e4 and he plays e5. Why? Why would he waste one move and now a second move? Well, because he's locked the center. And uh, he'll develop his bishop. Maybe he'll play h6 in the future to stop anything from coming to g5. He'll maybe play knight d4. He won't play knight d4 anymore. Bishop e6. And, uh, well, he plays this now and moves the bishop and then moves it back. And that's so that white cannot take to damage the structure. Now h6 will come for sure. And it does come in a few moves now that the bishop comes back. Uh, and h6, and, and now we have this position. Okay, so the sides have traded one pawn in 15 moves. Actually, 16. This is the 17th move now for black. Uh, then it would be 17. It wouldn't be 16. Let's just, let's just pretend that I know what I'm talking about. He takes on f4. And now we have a difficult decision by Artemiev to make. Does he take back on f4 with the bishop, or does he take back on f4 with the pawn? If he takes back with the bishop... He does get a dopamine move. He attacks the queen for one move. But when the queen backs up and teams up with the bishop, what's left? White has an isolated pawn in the center, and bishop h3 is coming. And if I can trade my, you, you know, your light squared bishop in front of your king, I'm going to be very happy. Uh, then I will continue to attack you on that side of the board. I mean, the position is still balanced. So Artemiev takes with the pawn with two ideas. Number one, keeping his pawns together, maybe e5. Number two, maybe king h1, rook g1. You never know. That's a long-term plan. Um... Maybe he'll bring this knight over here and open up his bishop. So we have a game. Bishop goes back to e6 to hit the knight. Defense. 
Now, of course, you're not going to do this. You say, well, isolated pawns like this are good and they're doubled. Huh, I'm so smart. Yeah, but you've completely surrendered the control of the center. Now white just clamps down on everything and pushes you off the board. So superseding concepts. Doubled pawns. Sure, that might be an advantage. Giving up all central space and allowing your opponent to steamroll you? Yeah, probably not so great. So knight to h5 targets the f4 pawn and forces white to make a pawn move, either e5 or f5. Now, funny enough, after f5, taking on c4 is really good. But you just said it was... But you just said it was bad. Yeah, I said it was bad, but it also depends which pawn white moves forward. See, if white had pushed this pawn forward, that would have been, that would have been good for white. But by playing this pawn forward, now black dominates the dark squares. You see that? When you trade off a light squared bishop for a knight, you give up light squared control, but you win dark square control. So black has three pieces that can fight for the dark squares and the queen as well. Uh, white has like, I don't even know what white is doing. White's got four pawns out and about and everybody else is back home. So it's actually very funny that e5 is the way to go. This is how you make your wedge. Um, and now Ding cannot take on c4 because... That's not what he wants, but he plays this very strong move, f5. And this is a very, very, very good move. Uh, this knight is kind of stranded on the side of the board, but it cannot really be targeted, like bishop f3 you just take. Uh, and if queen to d1, that looks pretty decent, but bishop f7 or even pawn to g6, now the knight can always go back, and black actually has secured some light squared real estate in the center. So queen to e8 is another way to protect. Queen e2, and now Ding Li Ren... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, just a great move. Again, very timely move to take over initiative. Everything is frozen. The center is frozen. You can't move the queen side. G5. Understanding that even though he's got pawns in front of his king, he can use those pawns to attack his opponent. And uh, takes, takes. The queen will come to G6 in a moment. Literally, I just said that. G4, F4, and he's, he's attacking. He's got the pawns. He's got the equipment and the tools necessary to attack. Whereas Artemyev is just being dominated. It's actually funny. In the span of a few moves, here the computer says it's minus 0.5, minus 0.6. Even you go back a few moves, like minus 0 0.2, 0 0.1, which is basically equal. But after f5, queen e8, g5, and, and this position, minus 2.8, like minus 2.9, it actually just straight up thinks the game is lost. And actually, if you give computers even more time to think when an attack is coming, like black has an attack coming, they just, it goes off the charts. Computers don't even realize how powerful an attack is. And once I give you a couple more moves, g4 to kick the knight out, and now f4, and bishop b4 just gets the queen out of the way, it's minus 6. Isn't that nuts? Like, from this position? So here, I think Artemiev had to play this move, like, anticipating that this was coming. So, for example, if now g4 attacking a ghost, I can go here and blockade the move f4. Artemiev just didn't allow any of this to... He, he, I mean, he, he, just, he just allowed the whole attack to come in, and now he's just lost. And he went for counterplay, he went for knight takes b7. And knight takes b7 might work against the lesser player like myself. Like if I'm playing Artemyev in this position with black, I'm starting to think, oh my god, I can't let him take this free pawn and attack my rook and now my knight is hanging. But Ding Li Ren's like, uh, so? You could take my rook, yeah, that's fine. But now you've lost your only active piece and, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm still here. There is no intimidation factor, I'm the, I'm the better player. So, knight d3, knight to f3 check, if, if this, then discovered attack, and you lose your queen, so king has to move, now the knight rotates, now I bring my f pawn. I mean, Ding Li Ren is just making this look so easy. He plays bishop h7, takes, and okay, he gets a bishop, and I just keep going. Like, this pawn just, <laughs> it's, a, it's a love story, they f in the g pawns, queen e4, rook f5, and all the way down we go, double check, now that bishop which was used to recapture the knight that took the rook, is suddenly a very valuable attacking piece. And, uh, he, well, I mean, Artemyev tries to create a little bit of complication, but I mean, he, just gets, I mean, he just gets brutalized. Queen g3, king moves out. Ki king has to move. Like, the king needs to go hide among the pieces. Uh, you know, queen e8 check is also possible, but then the knight would come back and block. Uh, rook f2, king h6, rook h2 you can't take. If anyone's confused, there's a rook on the other side of the board. And uh, yeah, Ding Li Ren just got his king out of danger and played very patiently and finally pushed the f-pawn. The f-pawn was the deciding factor between cutting off the rook to the king and uh, queen g2, queen h4 check, and Artemyev resigned because he can block with two queen moves uh, and he can lose in spectacular fashion. Queen takes h3 is mate, but it would be much more gangster to promote to a queen that's untouchable. 
because of the pin. And that would be the end of the game. And if you really want to flex, make a bishop. If you really want to flex, make a bishop. And uh, this is a winning endgame, even after like rook f2, for example, because you would go here. So just, just really like flex on your opponent. Folks, uh, Dingley Run just won two and a half half. So he just won the mini match. Uh, he's not like through or anything, but now he has a one nothing lead. So that, that is how that works. He is now up one nothing. You couldn't have made that more convincing. Which takes me to the match, the main event of the evening between Magnus Carlsen and Levan Ranyan. Here we go. And if you skipped ahead and you didn't even watch that other match, if you just clicked the timestamp, what are you doing? Come on. What are you doing? You don't have 30 minutes to watch a Gotham recap? I am offended. You come to me on the day of the semifinals of the Gold Money Asian Rapid. I'm gonna give you an offer you can't refuse. Anyway, e4, e5. We have Rui Lopez. a6. Anarchy chess is happy. Bishop a4. Bishop e7. And no Berlin. None of, the no none of the nonsense. We got a main line. b5, bishop b3, castles, d4. Now d4 is not quite a main line. Uh, c3, d4 is usually how they do this. And c3 and h3, but Aranyan plays d4 right away. We have d6. Okay, he plays c3, but he allows bishop g4. Uh, there's a lot of lines where white actually plays c3h3 to prevent that from happening. Bishop g4, bishop e3, takes, takes, black plays knight a5. That targets the bishop. Now, of course, white moves the bishop out of the way. Never mind. White gives up the bishop, and black keeps his bishop pair. Bishop d2. Why bishop d2? Why, why, hold on. Why did he play bishop d2? Anybody, anybody know? Well, because his center pawn was hanging. It actually has nothing to do with the bishop. And if he played something like knight d2, which does guard the pawn... That would have been an option. Maybe Magnus would have played c5 or c6 to make a little corral pawn structure, and we would have had a game of chess. But Aranyan goes here and moves his bishop to a5. That's kind of cool. Just plants the bishop over there, pressures c7. Queen b7, knight d2, and there you go. Everything that's coming through. We got a, we got a, we got a, a classical Spanish fight. Matador and the, and the bull. How do you say bull in Spanish? I don't remember. d5, bishop d8. B4 takes. Pawn takes or rook takes on a5? Of course, rook takes. You gotta have pressure on the queen side. Queen b6, queen b3, and queen a3. Justifying putting the rook on a5. And now we will have some pressure here while black tries to either create pressure down the center of the board or I don't know. h6 takes, takes, and b4. We have a new b pawn that's arrived. Now, Magnus here could have played c4. c4 does look optically very good opening up the queen. The problem is that he would allow Levon to walk down the board with his D and E pawns, and that's not for the faint of heart. So instead, he chooses to take on B4 and remove that pawn from existence, and basically uh, leave these pawns, but create his own play down the center lines and on this diagonal. Rook A2, Rook C7, Rook A1. I don't actually know what Levon is doing here. I'm sure there's some big meta, meta strategy. Um, I'm more interested, though, in this transition to a queenless, very, very imbalanced endgame. B and A pawns for black, just vibing. Can't really move forward because they'll get too weak. And white creates uh, this nice dragon scale of pawns. A5. Wait, I just said those pawns can't go forward. Well, they can't because rook B1. And the thing is, if now B4, I mean, you're going to lose both pawns. So Magnus plays A4 and gives this up to activate his pieces... Knight f1, rook a8, knight a3. Uh, where exactly is the play? You lost the b pawn. You're not really convincing me with this a pawn play. Rook c8, and what does Le what does Levon do? He's up a pawn. Trade everything. Just tr just trade everything. Trade everything. Knight g3, knight e8. Let's get that rook out of there. I don't like where that rook is. Knight e5. Get that rook out of there. I don't like the. Oh, get that bishop out of. Wait, actually, where's the bishop gonna go? It's trapped. It's bishop a6, rook a4. That's bad. So we have a trade, and now Levon's up two pawns. And listen, Magnus Carlsen's a pretty good chess player, but he's not going to beat or draw anybody down two pawns. Well, maybe like a, maybe like a guess the ELO submitter, but uh, not Levon. But Magnus brings his king a little bit. Levon, very solid, makes everything, makes sure that no, no counterplay is allowed. And uh, in this position, Magnus Carlsen resigns. Magnus Carlsen resigns. Levon Aranyan just outplayed Magnus Carlsen. The white pieces to take a 1-0 lead. We run in from the lion now, folks. All right, game number two. Magnus has the white pieces. Magnus plays and allows the Nimso Indian. E3. Castles. 
bishop d3. This is a main line. This is like a super duper main line. And after knight f3, it actually kind of becomes a Ragozin, you know, because uh, the bishop on b4, for example, if you will remember in this position, this is the Ragozin defense, and we can get to the exact same position, literally, like that happens in the game. dc4, and this is a. Uh, I forgot the exact name of this variation in, in, in the Nimso where white has the isolated pawn and black tries to play bishop here and either bring the bishop back or take on c3. Uh, in this game, black decided to bring the bishop back. And essentially here, we have a, 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 like the most classical white has an isolated pawn and in an isolated pawn position, the guy wants to blockade the square in front of it, target it with bishop f6. What white wants to do is utilize the open space around the isolated pawn to create an attack control the open files, control the open diagonals, and uh, chess gets played. So, rookie one, knight d7. There goes black trying to blockade the pawn on d5. And there goes white trying to utilize the squares around it to create an attack. And that's exactly what Magnus is doing. Queen e3, queen h3. I have no idea the theoretical status of this position. Truth be told, I downloaded all the games of this round like 30 seconds after the last game ended. I haven't had a chance to scan the theory. So... One of the stronger viewers is watching and is like, actually, this position has been played like 27 times before. But I'm just telling you that this is the strategy, right? So we have uh, we have some pieces traded. And long term, if this gets to an endgame, this pawn will just suck for white. But because white has so much activity right now, utilizing the squares around the, the pawn, white is happy. Uh, everything that I'm saying has come true. Uh, white has some initiative continuing. But now some pieces are coming off the board. And, and Aranyan is really trying to figure out this position. I mean, he's traded off just enough pieces that white no longer has an attack. So instead of having an attack, Magnus now turns his attention to the pressure on this side of the board and this very nice move g4. You would think that g4 is, oh, I'm going to go checkmate my opponent. Not really, because it invites yet another trade. Also, your rook and queen are kind of stuck defending this knight. Uh, the bishop is just covering everything. There's no attack. There really is no attack here. Uh, now there's like really no attack. Now we just have an endgame. That transformation really helped white. That transformation completely isolated this pawn forever. That pawn will never have a friend that had a friend for one move or two moves uh, when this trade occurred uh, over here. But now that pawn has gone back to being an F pawn. Uh, and uh, this pawn cannot really be targeted. And that pawn's weak. And if the bishop goes back to F6, which might happen, no promises. Oh, it's totally going to happen. Uh, notice how Magnus has just dominated this endgame. Why? Why does Magnus have an advantage in this endgame? Number one, more active pieces. Controls the only open file. His king is closer to the center. His knight is dominant, right? His knight is dominant. And maybe black will trade, but not if you're going to lose all the pawns. So white has everything. White has everything that you'd want. More space, more activity, dominates only open file on the board. Rook c6. Bishop takes, takes, and F takes, F takes, F takes. What would be the problem with D takes? Because black would be able to take control of the other open file and for the cost of one pawn, create counterplay. Let that sink in, learn your end games. This is called practical end games. Practical end game play. Magnus Carlsen takes with the F pawn because he doesn't want to open up the file for his opponent. Levon plays G5 and H5 looking to activate the open file, and he does. This is very, very clutch play, but Magnus counter clutch. It's a new word I just invented. D5. Why D5? Because he has to go gung ho and activity. He takes here, Levon gets just enough time to create play. So what does he do? He plays D5. Very high level stuff here. Pawn takes D5. He's not taking, he goes the other way. Because now he can guard both pawns. He can win this pawn, which is more valuable. He can then go target the f7 pawn with e6 and the king. He is going to focus on these four pieces. These two don't matter unless the rook comes down, and then I will take on b6. This pawn's a joker. That pawn's never going to become a queen. Rook h2, rook b6, rook f2, king g5. I've now won two pawns back. d4, rook d6. I told you that pawn was a joker. It was not valuable. Rook b3, a4, rook b4, rook f4. And Magnus glues it all together. And if you take take, this is a losing king and pawn endgame. You're not going to hold this. You're not going to hold this. King f8, king f5, rook b1, e6. I told you this is the practical way to try to win this game. Maybe we get this. Maybe. But this pawn's going to be very valuable. This king's going to try to run over there. I'm going to go try to win that a pawn. So we have king to e7, takes takes, king g5. Magnus goes for the a5 pawn. Levon loses it. This is a completely lost endgame. It's a completely lost endgame. For the following reason, 
You can advance two pawns freely. You can trade rooks whenever you want. You have that wild card. Push that pawn all the way. Push that pawn. Black is too spread out. We get this king, uh, the rook away. We play rook c6. And uh, resignation because now the king will walk and help the pawn. And this rook is still guarding this. And Magnus Carlsen strikes back. High level chess here, y'all. Really high level chess. Uh, third game was a quick draw. So things slow down. Which takes us to game number four, fourth and final round. That's not what they say in the UFC. But Magnus Carlsen's got to win this game. So what does he do against D4 Knight F6? Londres. Is that how you say London in French? Isn't it also Londres in Spanish? I don't know. I just combined a Spanish word with a French accent. Welcome to Gotham Chess Recaps. E3. Now here there's an interesting line. Bishop to G4. Uh, and what I like to do against Bishop to G4 is I actually like to play F3. And if the bishop hangs around, I like to play g4. And actually, that's exactly how this game went. Except Levon went this way, and Magnus still played g4. And what white likes to do here is h4, sometimes even c4. Just take all the space. So Magnus plays c3, because c5 got played. If c5 wasn't played, you would play c4, but you try to reinforce like this. And let's have a queenless middle game. Let's have a queenless middle game. So, e6. Both sides are trying to... Uh, make the other side take them so they can open up their rooks. We have uh, c4, and Magnus says, Nope, psych, you locked that side of the board, now I'm going to bring my queen back. You can't win b2, and maybe I'll play for e4 in the future, now that you've locked the center. So we have a trade, and e4. Now this allows queen f4, that, that looks really powerful, except that move is really bad, because I kick your knight out, and then I kick your queen out, and then I just continue to take as much space as possible, and this is just very bad for black. So instead of that, queen c7, I still kick your knight out and knight to e2. Uh, white has a lot of space here, but the position is 0, 0, 0 because black has opportunity to create a lot of pawn breaks. Like black can play for this, black can play for this, black can even in some lines play for an h5 break, including right now, and lock the set. Like if the board gets locked, it's just going to be, the game is going to be dead. Uh, and that actually happens. Levon does play this. Pawn takes h5, rook h5. And Magnus didn't want to close the game. So he, Magnus just didn't, didn't want a position to look like this because he's just never going to win this. Uh, it's going to take him a, a monumental effort to try to play a move like b3 uh, and try to rip everything open over there. Although, although I will say it's probably more accurate to play this move than immediately g6. So that on, on the move b3, um, you're at least like more equipped to fight against the center, like to go like knight e3 and everything. Here's the problem with playing b5 and trying to hang on over there. You can, but there's lines where I can play like a4, and if you do this, you lose a rook. So you've got to lock the position the right way. And so Magnus says, rather than doing that, I'm going to have the open file. Levon plays king f8, protecting his pawn. Knight f3, knight g7, knight g3, rook h6. Okay, now what? Queen d2. I don't understand this move at all. I'm not going to try to explain it to you. b5. Levon's got more space on the queen side. He's playing on the queen side. a3, a5. All right, Levon's in good shape. Like, Levon, Levon's doing his thing. Personally here, I thought that knight a5, knight b3, and then a5 was better, but I'm just a, uh, I'm just a spectator. a5, h4, and Levon plays f5, which is, again, a move I, I, don't, I don't fully understand. I guess he was afraid of Magnus himself playing this, or maybe playing bishop h3 and preventing anything from coming to f5. I would have thought Levon would have kept pushing here. But clearly, Levon just wanted to lock everything before this. The problem is that once the pawn goes forward, it cannot go back. And now you've weakened the whole complex here. And Magnus just, boop, plays bishop to e2. And he's ready to either move this bishop out of the way or transfer his queen or just castle or move his king. Like, he's, he's going to come in with the pieces very soon. Not to mention that h5 is a target. And you can even get to f7. Um, knight d8, king f2. Like, you've given Magnus something to play for. And now, a4. And a4 locks the board. Like, you, before you play a4, you still have it within yourself to set up the move b4. But once you go here, there's no turning back. Your strategy is, I'm gonna lock this thing up, and you're not gonna be able to win. And Magnus is like, okay. <laughs> like, all right. Rook g1, h5, knight h6, knight g5. It's like, call my bluff. Rook a6, knight back to f1. Every move Magnus has made since I said boop has been designed to target 
that side of the board. And he's a bit, every move, literally every move. And every move, the advantage is growing more and more. Like the machine is just every move like, oh, yes, I really like this. Yes, 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 yes. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Bishop B8, uh-huh. Knight comes to the middle, uh-huh. Bishop F3. And a lot of you always ask me like, how do you play close positions? Well, this is how. Uh, you walk your king to the other side of the board. Like, let's escort the king underground, under the uh, underneath the uh, the presidential building, because we're we're about to have some violence here. So, rook d7, and all empires will collapse from two sides. That's I don't know if some if some historians said that, or I just made that up in a in a recap on July first, two thousand twenty-one. You got two signs of weaknesses. Stretch thin. Knight takes d5. A move that looks impossible, but is possible if pawn takes d5, e6 crashes down the middle, because that's why you had to escort the king. So Levon plays like this. Magnus doesn't take the rook, he takes the bishop first. Knight f7, bishop d5, e5, and the rook takes g7. We've infiltrated, this is bad. Red alert, sound the alarm. Knight h6, queen g2. Knight g4, he don't need no rook, rook takes. Pawn takes, queen takes. Magnus Carlsen has three pawns for that knight. And uh, he's also got just an avalanche of pawns coming down. King e8, f5. Levon, to his credit, does something really smart here. He plays knight takes. And the point of this is to get into an endgame down a pawn. You're completely lost here. Completely lost. Head to toe. I don't... Dead lost position. Uh, but it's hard. It's, it's actually a little bit tricky here because they both have about 30 seconds. The winning idea is queen check. Let's say the king moves to d7, for example. Now, you don't just necessarily rush with a queen trade. Um, you need to find a way to attack this king without weakening your own, and you play king b1. And you hide over here, and then you, like, rotate the queen and find a way in with your rook. That's pretty hard to play with no time on the clock, especially if black, if black plays, like, rook f8 to try to create counterplay. Um, yeah, you play queen b6, and you just go like this, make sure that your king is not under attack, can always hide on a2, make the way for your rook. Very instructive. Get the king, continue to get the king to safety, Transfer the queen out of the way for the rook. Magnus instead plays f6 with the intention to open up this, but that allows something devastating. Check, and now, check. And because you pushed your pawn one square too far, after this queen trade, the king is a move away from winning your pawn. And you moved your king away from the center. You moved your pawn closer to black's king and your king away from this. This is holdable. Now Magnus only has rook g5 to hold this and try to get one of those pawns. And again, it's low time and everything just shifted. He plays rook h1, we're back to zeros. King f7, h6, king takes f6. It's a draw. I mean, it's simply a draw. The only winning chance that white has, that white has, is playing something like king c1 uh, to try to get this pawn. And for example, if black just belligerently goes for this, this is a losing king and pawn endgame. This is lost. And you need to be aware of the fact that your king needs to be on e6. It must be here in this position. It must be here. Because, for example, like something like this is a draw. Because you can just play something like king d6. And by the way, even though this is kind of scary, you constantly have opposition. You do not let the king get closer. You're like, ah, but stay away. Hey, hey. It's like you're guarding a celebrity. Hey, 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 hey. No. Six feet. Twelve feet. Okay? That's the only way to win this. So Levon cuts off the king. Rook d1 is a very tricky move because, again, you are looking to get that king and pawn endgame. And Levon uh, plays rook d3, which is a, a also a very tricky move because if takes, uh, now you lose. Now white loses because I get the pawn and this is right. So Magnus goes rook h1 to re-threaten the advancement. Now you only have one move. You cannot stop the pawn with the king. You have to go back. Magnus does not... Uh, repeat moves, he plays h7, and um, king g7, you have to stop me, and rook h5. This is a brutally tricky move. Rook h5 makes it very tough for black to make a move here. For example, if you play king h8, I take the pawn for free. I've now split three of your pawns. I have some serious winning chances here. Uh, if you play something like uh, e3, that's the best move. But it's very difficult with 10 seconds on the clock to calculate if this endgame that we just looked at, whether it's a draw or not. But e3 is the best move. And I, I mean, for example, something like rook here, 
uh, king h7, rook e3. This is still very tough to tell if it's a draw, but you have to find rook d5, holding everything. And Levon in this position played rook to e8, trying to escort the pawn, but he doesn't escort anything because after this, he's lost. And Magnus scrapes out a victory even after throwing it away with the queen trade into that super tricky position. And now that's it. It's just game over. And by the way, here he offers this very tricky trade of rooks to just get into a winning king and pawn endgame by virtue of outflanking. If this pawn did not exist, this would be a draw. A and king cannot defeat a king, but B and A sure can. And uh, he just simply brings the king. Notice, by the way, he doesn't even go for this. This is actually, this is a draw. A and C or F and H, like this, drawable. It's, it, it, I believe it or not, two pawns up, A and C can still be a draw, but king C3, this is lost. And uh, he does manage to beat Levon despite going down one nothing early, two and a half, one and a half, a uh, lot of end games in this mini match, and Magnus Carlsen has a one nothing lead in the semifinal. That was a pretty fun recap. Five games, but we got to go a little bit more in depth. We didn't have to speed through anything. I hope you enjoyed, and tomorrow we will determine which two play in the finals, uh, and which two will play for third and fourth place. As always, peace out. Get out of here.